In other news, officials at the Pacific Nuclear Research Facility have denied the rumor that a case of missing plutonium was in fact stolen from their vault two weeks ago. <laughs> How far are you going? Oh, about 40 years. Welcome back to Dirt Obsession everyone. Today we're excited to present our test and review of Yamaha's Moto 4, the first four-wheeled ATV offering from Yamaha and what would become a long lineage of ATV dominance by the Blue Crew. The Moto 4 wasn't the first four-wheeled ATV, but it was ahead of its time in terms of features and capability. For example, its headroom is technically better than any ATV on the market today. It's got redundant starting capability and an ingenious front rack that somehow devolved with time. But the profile of the Moto 4 harkens back to an even earlier version of the ATV. Subtle design cues that let you know the Moto 4 was more adaptation than creation. So let's go back to the beginning of this story, the genesis of ATVs in the four-wheeled variety. And for that, we're headed back to the 80s. They're fun. They're practical. They're easy to ride, and they're inexpensive to own and operate. They're the Yamaha Tri-Motos. And now, Yamaha has a complete line of Tri-Motos. Two strokes and the new four strokes. As tough and powerful as only Yamaha can make them. There's a national craze for the motorized three-wheeler, manufactured by the four motorcycling giants, Honda, Yamaha, Kawasaki, and Suzuki. are 1.8 million of them in the U.S., and today sales are climbing. Man, the 80s were wild. We had it all back then. True freedom and liberty, albeit not without extreme risk of physical injury. But somewhere along the way, the tone started to change. The possibility of simply not participating in dangerous activities to avoid injury never occurred to anyone. The trouble is that during an ATV's average lifespan of seven years, there is a one in three chance that the ATV will carry its rider to serious injury or death. From what I've seen in my five years as a commissioner here, this is one of the most serious emerging safety concerns ever to hit the American public. As a country, we pointed our fingers squarely at Honda, Suzuki, Kawasaki, and Yamaha, insisting the injuries incurred were part of some sort of devious plot. Of course, their first instinct was to counter-accuse. We, we believe they're very stable. Uh, we believe that the rider essentially influences the stability of the vehicle to easily learn the fundamental skills of handling an ATC and ride it very safely. The manufacturers argue that riders who fail to wear protective gear and who drink alcohol then ride are largely responsible for three-wheeler accidents. Blaming our drinking and our riding abilities, which of course set off a cold war of sorts because Americans knew damn well that the problem wasn't alcohol or skills. Any attempt to restrict drinking and driving here is viewed by some as downright undemocratic. Something had to give, and the Japanese had learned 40 years earlier that Americans weren't likely to acquiesce. So the Japanese motorcycle companies set their engineers to task on developing alternative products that significantly increased the likelihood of repeat buyers by generously sparing their lives. Under pressure from Congress, the industry did tone down advertising directed at children. It added a fourth wheel on some models for greater stability. Suzuki figured it out first. Then in 1984, Yamaha added a fourth wheel to the venerable Trimoto 200DE, which effectively both increased stability and extended the life expectancy of the rider. Specs on the Moto 4 were impressive. 
The four-stroke 196cc air-cooled engine paired with a Makuni carburetor pumps out around 15 ponies, which actually feels pretty peppy for its weight of around 400 pounds. What do you think about the moto? She's an 86, but I tell you, she runs like an 87. Yeah. Yeah, she's pretty sweet. That's 15 ponies under the hood, boy. I'm telling you, you can feel it, you could feel all 15 of them. Nice. Yep. And don't ever let anyone tell you that 2.6 inches of front suspension travel is too short because it's perfectly reasonable and everybody knows it's not the length, it's how it's used. Anyway, 4.3 inches of rear suspension travel combined with slightly under-pressured tires and a plush foamy seat make for passable all-day riding comfort. I just had to keep my mouth shut and experience this thing for a little while because that's my first ride and it was uh it's actually pretty fun on the trail it's uh it's just super torquey and um you know we, we joke about it not having any power but like i got a couple gears to grab left and uh <laughs> um, I mean, it'll, it's not gonna, it's not gonna pull your arms out of socket, boys. But it's, <laughs> it's more fun than it should be. That's, uh, I think that's the point. This thing is, is way more fun than it should be, and you could totally like trail ride it all day long. And uh, it's just kind of cool from a nostalgia aspect to uh, be on Yamaha's first four-wheeler because obviously we we love the Raptors and um, love the Grizzlies and Yamaha's come a long way but there's just nothing there's just nothing like checking out the first four-wheeler ever to the vein of the uh, three-wheel guys existence of course a uh, dry spot the Moto4's length was 68.9 inches long in the US and Canada and 72.8 inches for all other markets. Width and wheelbase were both 44.1 inches, which is just beautiful symmetry. It was hard to find the exact MSRP of a machine of this age, but suffice it to say I probably paid pretty darn close to the original MSRP 40 years later, so resale value is definitely better than your CF Moto. These things were really meant as, you know, tools. Um, it, I, it's got my little my little rack up there. Put your lunchbox in. It's got a nice big rack on the back. And uh, most importantly, a solid axle, which is always super fun. And then the uh, five-speed like variable variable mesh um, transmission which is clutchless so it really feels like uh, we had tested a um, Rubicon with a foot shift a Honda Rubicon with a foot shift and it really kind of feels like that um, shifting it feels exactly like that really where your foot shift is just kind of a torque controller and uh, when you need more of a gear you kick it up and um, that's it uh, and then all the way down is neutral, which is makes a lot of sense. Makes finding neutral pretty easy. It's uh, fairly easy to get into reverse, and it's just a good lot of fun. These are low maintenance little machines that just—I mean, there's no chain. It's before anybody was worried about the reliability of a CVT, and I—I uh, I don't know. <laughs> I just. 
I feel like these things were just such great tools for just putting around a farm or you know whatever you needed to do. Oh, we're off trail now, boys. Ah, oh, blazing new territory on the Moto 4. And we turn around and go back because the territory became unblazable. And I got brought back down to earth real quick. And they're probably not going to break the whole back end loose a whole lot with the 15 ponies, but uh, I don't know. I, I can just woo, I can just do everything that is absolutely necessary to do on the trail. And I'm not trying to sell this thing, obviously. This is more of like a retrospective as to how far Yamaha and four-wheelers in general have come. You know, we've seen the, the ebbs and flows after this one, obviously. This four-wheeler begets certain models in its immediate wake. Like the Moto 4 itself went to the uh, 225 and then eventually the 350 and it added four wheel drive. And uh, you know, then we had the separation after the 350 made it motor came out. We had the Warrior, obviously. And um, the Warrior eventually evolved into the Raptor. And the more utility side, which is definitely the Moto 4 side. Obviously that became the Kodiak and the Grizzly lineup. Uh, the variations of the big bears. So it was just kind of cool to see where it all began. And it's really, first of all, it's pleasantly surprising how good this thing runs because she catches fire, boys. Starts right up. Doesn't miss a beat. No sputtering. Nothing. So, not bad for a 40 year old lady. Oh, deep, roady, porky noise. You gotta love it. We'll see when I can really open her up. Get a little top speed test going. Speedometer list. When this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're gonna see some serious shit. I can't for sure say what the top speed of this would be, unequivocally. But if I had to wager a guess, I am going to say that this would probably get somewhere in the neighborhood of the low 30 mile an hour. I know some of you will balk at that, but there's a lot of four-wheelers that remain on the market today uh, that are the flagship in some cases for other manufacturers that won't do a lick over 40. And most four-wheelers aren't going to get the opportunity to go that fast very often. I'm not trying to rationalize this or say everybody should go out and buy a Moto 4. All I'm saying is I'm having fun on it. In the modern era of ATVs, where power is prioritized as essential to performance at the literal expense of cost and figurative expense of weight, combined with the occasional headache of complicated gadgetry, it's nice to know a 40-year-old machine can still scratch the itch. The Moto can still conquer 95% of the terrain that most reviews would have you believe require five times the performance numbers. The Moto 4 is certainly a relic of a bygone era, but the lessons it taught back in the 80s brought about the birth of modern 4x4s. Perhaps the lessons it can teach today are even more important. Huge displacement is an illusion. Simplicity makes reliability, and sometimes... Progress in technology causes us to lose touch with the basic elemental instinct that drew us out to the trails in the first place. Or maybe I just like riding old shit.